Oh, I made it. This game, man. Oh, come on! Ninja Gaiden. It's tough! The IP was modernized by Tomonobu Itagaki, who... Well, that's a read and a half, but he does like Pikmin. So Ninja Gaiden's awesome, and I hope the games won't mind taking what they dish out. Thumb damage, mostly. If you've heard about the Gaiden, you've heard a couple of things. It's comically violent, it's really hard, and the owners haven't been able to settle on definitive versions of their games. I wanted Ninja Gaiden at its best, so with some recommendations and forum trawling, I'm doing Black, Vanilla 2, and Razor's Edge. This will not be debated, Sigma games will not be considered, so go hump a stump, you bloodless chumps! Calling Ninja Gaiden hard isn't saying much. Enemies bully the player from all sides and often at range. Demand an understanding and ready application of your options. Non-combat segments require a kind of precision that the game isn't mechanically suited to, I'd argue. Adversity is created in the varied forms and contexts of the challenges thrown at the player, in the way that challenge is prescribed to the player. But Ninja Gaiden's strongest feature is its combat, the least prescriptive challenge the player faces. In a phrase, it doesn't celebrate its greatest strengths, and that makes every iteration hard to get through. Ninja Gaiden Black is a technical marvel most of the time, runs incredibly well, looks unbelievably good for its generation, and has a lot of varied environments and challenges. I won't lie, I struggled through it, it was my first Ninja Gaiden game after all, but it's such a complete package kind of game, it gets respect for that alone, even if the story leaves a bit to be desired. Someday you will come There's to no understand the There's no way he's not evil. The combat stands out immediately, Ryu controls a bit odd, nothing like Dante with his instant turnarounds and controlled jump arc, you roll and flip and block and run, rise and fall, blaze through enemies. I liken it to water, a control scheme with a lot of seamlessly integrated options and fluidity, but moments where the rapid that is Ryu is committed to its path. It takes some getting used to, but for the most part, it doesn't damage the experience. And it's not as overly complex as you might assume. Yeah, it's got combos, but they're mostly dialed in, a series of buttons you hit and a pretty generous window. So even your mom can do an Azuna drop with a little practice. The visceral joy of combat is the crux of everything, I think. That essential piece of Ninja Gaiden cannot be removed, or the game is nothing. With that in mind, here's why Ninja Gaiden combat fun and good. Ryu Hayabusa's a f***ing ninja, and it ain't no lie, baby. Bye bye bye. Turns out running up walls and skull splitting dudes is pretty cool. Incidentally, turns out running on walls and multi-decapping scores of foes is even cooler. Using the environment to your advantage is something more action games should do, and this game was ahead of the curve compared to Devil May Cry on that front. Ryu Hayabusa is like that old high school friend you don't talk to, because he's got a lot of weapons. The player has all kinds of tools to work with if something's too challenging. Sometimes combat's a bit like a puzzle, and it's nice that the devs were willing to let you work it out with lots of options. Lastly, the odds are stacked against you in every fight. You slay hordes of ninjas and demons, and every fight is both frantic and strategic. You have to choose to commit yourself to a deadly combo, maybe cutting an enemy or two down, but always risking a back attack. It's why stuff like the Izuna drop and the Flying Swallow are so good. Good. They're low risk options that can hit multiple enemies. Very often you're safer attacking from the air, if you can get there. The combat is tweaked, so even weak enemies are scary. Getting grabbed for 40% of your health sucks, but at least you'll respect the enemy after. Most encounters are consistently engaging. Unfortunately, the game often bogs down progression with excessive throwaway enemies, the bats, the insects, the stupid floating demons that only exist to get blasted by lightning, the ghost fish, and whoever designed them in particular can go explode. And for all that good stuff, someone at Team Ninja thought, what if... <laughs> One fun line I came up with while playing Ninja Gaiden was, why won't they let the game be fun? And that's because mostly everything but rock combat has issues. The game is committed to variants, so transitions from combat to platforming segment to combat to puzzle, but so many of the platforming sections are just... <laughs> Now, to be fair, some of them are really good, and I like the way the level designs often encourage different ways to move through them. They're never just singular hallways leading to encounters, and the world feels more fleshed out for it. But take this section, for example, which would be fairly inoffensive if four hovering laser drones weren't constantly sweeping the room to knock you off the tiny platforms you can just barely consistently jump to with the awkward stick and camera controls. I think I spent 40 minutes in here, and this one can go 
bite buckets. And you know I love casually swimming in a water level for 30 minutes in my violent neck-severing ninja game. Ninja Gaiden has story elements, characters, plot points, allegedly. I feel like Itagaki dumped a bunch of vague characters on the creative team's desk and told them to just do it. So later, the one writer's like, hey, uh, Mr. Itagaki, sir, what should the tone for this scene be? And he's like, oh yeah, Ryu has muscles. The last major facet of gameplay is boss battles. They're huge, extremely dangerous, really make use of the enormous 3D space. For a first pass of what the series could be, they're not terrible. But I stand by the notion that the bosses aren't great overall, and I think it's because the devs can't assume what weapon the player is using. Now, some weapons do better in some fights than in others, but by and large, the game doesn't require the use of this or that weapon in battles because it can't. It throws enough weapons with different capabilities of the player, which need to be upgraded over time and most of which are optional pickups, the player needs to be able to beat bosses with anything. Every boss is one of three flavors, more or less. A lumpy, unimpressive enemy with a fairly uninteresting fight that you can win by any means if you respect a few attacks. A Simon Says or Die fight, where the enemy has very obvious tells and sometimes obvious patterns, but if you don't respect them and react appropriately, you just lose. And deadly duels that often have bizarre and inconsistent properties. Behold the smelly trinity. <laughs> the lumpy dudes usually go down in one pass, and I think they're a symptom of the devs designing a bunch of stuff and throwing it in just because. The ice cave maggot thing is almost harmless, along with one third of King Ghidorah and this guy. They exist, mostly only test your ability to roll and jump and go down right away. They're not terribly memorable, but can make you feel good about yourself, like a quick rub on a Friday night. The Simon Says bosses, particularly the worms, are some of the worst. You'll often have to figure out the pattern through trial and error, so dying, running back, and restarting, but once you have it down, the boss is harmless. It's just a matter of jumping when it says jump, and cutting when it says cut. Nothing I'm really proud of, and nothing really enjoyable. The dual enemies, particularly Alma, Doku, and Spirit Doku, and the final boss suffer from inconsistent defensive properties and bizarre hitboxes. None of them are consistently vulnerable to Flying Swallow, even when attacking them at seemingly identical points in their recovery animations. It makes some of the fights feel way more like random scrambles than measured duels. They have impressive attacks, but crazy hitboxes. Spirit Doku is hard to keep up with because of the lack of clarity in the swings and how overwhelming they are, but regular Doku might be even worse. Look at this. Do you think? This is okay? I get that it's a hitbox that's bigger than the animation suggests, but like, shut up, game. Okay, the second issue is a bit of a nitpick. My real gripe is simple. The dual bosses turn into repetitive cycles of single attack or single combo into defense. They became incredibly stale for the sake of victory. None of the bosses bespeak any particularly interesting design or really let Ryu go full combo mode with the player's weapon of choice. They give you a bit of an opening occasionally, barely make use of flying swallows and never wall running mechanics, never make you swap weapons mid-fight or use particular projectiles to open weak spots. They never really aspire to much more than bash the boss, and even with a few weird standouts, you're still restricted in what you should do to win. It feels like, with how cool and free and environmentally interactive the combat is, the bosses should be more about environmental combat, combat puzzle solving. They could be more. Again, they're not awful, they're just varied enough, but together they contribute to why the game is hard. Calling Ninja Gaiden difficult, I reiterate, isn't saying much. Typical combat is difficult, but it's a fun, player-directed challenge. It doesn't feel hard. The rest, however, is a multitude of strangely varying challenges that culminate in an extremely choppy playthrough. A game that's constantly cutting its fun bits short for annoying ones. It's always mixing up the challenge, but sometimes less is more. Shoot, maybe I should have played Sigma. It's fighting the weird camera, failing through so many stiff and awkward platforming sections, swimming through water at half speed, getting lost in Tyran, and so many full stop boss fights. Fights that force you to learn and in particular obey before you can keep playing. It barely masks its many progression killers as novelty, and there's some value in that for some players. The people who appreciate the world Ninja Gaiden is selling. A dog-eat-dog -dog war zone where only the master ninja thrives. The repeat player. The difficulty challenger. The game's progression is bizarre as well. It starts out so strong with the village and tyrant sections, like those can be hard, allegedly playthrough ending, but it's all doable with some defensive play. Then you go underground and the game tanks with it, halting your progress, making fights brutally long. But by the time you get out, do some more levels, the game's done before you know it. Who's the final boss? Who's Grillface? 
Oh my god, it's impossible. <laughs> Overall, it's less difficult than 2, I'd argue, because it's not designed to physically age you like that game. And the devs were actually fairly charitable to the player. They must have known how hard it could be and left a lot of free healing items throughout the levels. The player's given many tools to complete combat segments in their own way, and powerful ninpo, which all grant hefty invincibility frames and free damage to many bosses, get out of jail free cards for unfun fights. And while the game grades your performance, low scores never act hurt you, though it'd be a bit of a help if high scores let you upgrade weapons faster. Despite my gripes, the game throws hurdle after hurdle at you, but always allows you to pass them, with enough cunning, effort, and time. Yes, now for a Chad's game. Now I think some people like Sigma, cause you can fight the, uh, the Statue of Liberty, but I think it's best experienced raw and uncut. And cheesy. So Itagaki strapped Ryu into a chair one day and did a little acupuncture session, turning him into a roid raging psychopath, and now the game's turbo Game's playing at twice the speed, old dude's getting dunked. Oh, that's bull <laughs> Mew, shurikens don't do damage. The creators are extremely straight. If I stopped after the first two chapters, I would've thought this was the best game in the series. Let me level with you. This game's a hard love it or hate it, and there's a lot to hate. But God, it's so fun. The game's way less appropriate for all audiences than before. Enemy arms flop off with a swing. The Azuna drop turns torsos to pulp in a flash. You can execute limping enemies for a few seconds of free time and a flashy animation. Ryu is totally demented. When enemies appear, the walls are getting a paint job courtesy of the dragon ninja. It's disgusting. You'll love to see it. Weapons were a big deal before, but Ryu's fixing for a full-scale FBI investigation this time. So many weapons, so many ways to kill, such huge move pools. The game is fine with letting some enemies suck to fight because there's more than one weapon for everything. I really love weapons like the Kasari Gama and their huge AoE potential, shredding whole rooms to bits and dunking dumbos. The Eclipse Scythe always comes out for a big enemy and Ryu can combo kill any solo enemy with the flails without a scratch. Y'all wanna learn how to do a an infinite? Even the Dragon Sword allows for consecutive flying swallows. Dude! Of course, they put more enemies in the game, noticeably more. Itagaki invited the entire demon realm and every ninja clan on the planet, because these f**ks are absolutely swarming in every level, every room. You can't stand still, and the game's always ready to let you know. Piss off. It often spawns enemies behind you, and even more frequently as you turn a corner or run down a hall into the classic, oh, f this game suffers from frame rate terrorism, constantly throwing enough bodies at the player that the game slows to a crawl. You gotta see it to believe it. How about this clip? Oh, I appear to have clipped through the railing with Flying Swallow revealing 30 leaping psychopaths and the performance is tanking off a cliff. The enemies seriously aren't a joke. Ranged attacker is hard to stagger enemies. Ninja dogs? If you cut off a guy's legs, he'll crawl towards you and try to take you both out? Like the first boss, turns into a normal enemy later? I, I know that's not saying much, but when the game throws three of them and a plethora of elite ninja assassins at you simultaneously, it's brutal. It's harrowing. If the first game was about using all your tools to win, this game's about abusing whatever you can to scrape by. I mean, this game taught me to abuse charging ultimate techniques and specifically essence charging, things that were in the last game but were hardly necessary. But this game will teach you quick. Drops you in a room, poof, there's a gang of ninjas and an ex-boss monster. The camera won't cooperate and the game's moving at a million miles an hour. You barely have time to think and certainly no time to get away. You're going to die. You start attacking, pull back, Take a moment to breathe and launch a fireball. Take a few more hits, see your chance, charge a cheeky ultimate move and tear through a few of them. See in essence, insta-charge and put that spider in the dirt. It's exhilarating in a way many games can never be. Deadass reminds me of Marvel, no other comparison. The game cheeses you all kinds of times, but those real smelly ones only pop up once. Invisible minds after a boss fight, indeed. And honestly, the game's pretty fair with the ninpo iframes and like the last game, letting you pause even mid combat to heal up with consumables. Every impish Itagaki trick could make for a potential bullet point in a gaming sins script, but as a whole, they're harmless and add a little character to the game. I can see a boy winking through his sunglasses, cheeky coon. For all my apologism, the game suffers from a problem that comes perhaps from the reduction of the last game's non-combat segments. It's funny, I thought Black would be better off ditching its Resident Evil level design and frustrating platforming bits, but this game's mostly that. Linear kill rooms and it 
Kinda sucks. Okay, it's not that clear cut. The levels are often open enough, thought out enough, to feel real. You cycle through a few different challenges, which mostly amount to extremely easy platforming segments, annoying arrow spam segments, and even the kill rooms consider physical space and let the player play a video game. <laughs> To be fair, there's a fat chunk of boring square rooms with no interactive elements, and that's a shame. And all the challenges are back to back, right? You don't have to jog halfway back through Tyron to open a door. It's just raw progression. The struggle is burnout. It's endless waves of enemies, the constant need for alertness, the cheap little gotcha moments the game keeps throwing at you, the barrage of assorted projectiles streaming at the player, and free heals at save points or not, you're gonna be strapped for health. It's really rough sometimes, almost a slow. It's constantly stopping progress with fights that force you to change up your tactics, and I wouldn't be shocked if it was just too much for the average player. So let's switch it up and talk about the world. I really liked what Black did. It clearly took place in a modern setting, but the relics of the past, the weird magical elements, and the ruins built under the fictional Tyrant helped to convey a mystical other reality. Ninja Gaiden 2 checks most of that out the window and gives us Tokyo, but taller. Russia, New York, Venice, it's just the real world with some odd tweaks. Getting backdoor by demons. I kind of wish they fleshed the thing out as a cool alternate Earth. Now the characters that populate the setting are aggressively forgettable. It's an achievement. Starting with Rachel's no value replacement, though I have to say Itagaki's porcelain doll fetish is getting on my nerves. Why is Rasputin here? Who's this? I'm kidding. I don't... <laughs> I don't care. There's a lot of demons. Like this one. Your path is one of sound and fury. Ultimately signifying nothing. You don't get to misquote Macbeth at me! No, no! I guess if you wanted to, you could say the plot is... <laughs> the bosses are equal to or worse than the previous game, depending on your viewpoint. Look, they're hard stops or free passes. The ones that you get stuck on, you're really getting stuck on, and others die in two seconds. None of them have any kind of considered or environmentally minded design, though the environment often serves as a hindrance or limitation during battle. A lot of boss types exist, just like before, but certain horrible ones stand out so much more. The extremely busy double armadillo fight, the completely formulaic first phase of the final boss, the arrows only dragons that shouldn't exist, whatever the floating metal caterpillar Giga Death is. Oh my god, are you seeing this? I can't! These fights were just awful, and the common element is not being able to hit them. Long waiting times and excessive defensive play to the point where you're just flipping around mindlessly, and a focus on arrows, like why? Defensive play is fine in these games, if you ignore it, you're dead. But other bosses do it better. Bosses like Alexi and the Macbeth Demon, who are vulnerable at specific points, throw out crazy fast attacks you have to dodge, but can be made vulnerable with aggressive play once you understand them. And often they go down quickly. The challenge lies in getting in and doing your damage swiftly and cleanly. I can appreciate those fights, but I don't appreciate Genshin. Genshin is a battle fought four times, and quite literally the fun ender that caps off literally decapitates the most fun segment of the game. He's supposed to be a deadly rival, so like Doku from the last game, but even Doku let you jump and flying swallow. Genshin is Doku with even more restrictions. He has fewer utility moves, mostly just rushes Ryu down, and has pretty clear punish windows once you've gotten tossed around a bit, but will often surprise the player with counterattacks and random blocking, so that's fun. If you flying swallow, Genshin will likely block. If you jump and he's free, he'll flying swallow you. It's supposed to feel like a fair match, but you quickly realize the strategy boils down to repeatedly dashing away and blocking, and when the opening comes, getting a few cheeky hits off before running back. It's not a duel, well, not a flashy one anyway. It's an oppression session. It kind of blows my mind that even in this game, NG2, the turbo installment, the gory slash fest, that most of the important fights never go wild, never give the player windows to really wail on these enemies and, you know, enact the gameplay they've learned everywhere else in the endless fights before the bosses. Ninja Gaiden's fun isn't celebrated by its hardest challenges. Why is that? I guess you could call it fitting that a more serious fight would ask that Ryu, overly serious wretch that he is, act like a true ninja, deadly and clean, quiet and calm. But I don't feel good in Ninja Gaiden because I did the right thing. I feel good because I did the crazy cool ninja move. You don't get crazy cool ninja moves against Genshin, or most bosses for that matter. Game's a total wreck. I love it to death. Ninja Gaiden 2 has the balls to burn the player out, 
spit in the player's eyes, then turn on the strobe lights and jam Nightcore in their ears. I'd easily go back and play it before any other entry, and that's because, all things considered, it's all about the blades, the blood, and the fun. Then Itagaki left. <laughs> Can't polish a turd, right? Can't sharpen a heart either, it just starts gushing blood. So Ninja Gaiden 3 is an unfortunate step for the series, and you gotta wonder how much of it could have been diverted by just paying Itagaki his bonus check. Whatever, that's all muddy and outside the scope of this critique. And the other game wasn't the final nail, but Yaiba is smelly, so be gone, spirit. The game tanks so bad for a big deal franchise that they tightened a lot of crap and released Razor's Edge, the effective Ninja Gaiden Black to the original. Only people liked Black. Maybe because the game was good to begin with. This entry focuses on elements of the series that weren't previously explored, pushing to integrate narrative elements into gameplay, really doubling down on the story for some reason, trying to make every seg from kill room to kill room significant, often to its detriment. You know, pushing that triple A cinematic feel. Y'all like eight hour movies? Ninja Gaiden 1 and 2 both caused me to take some time off while playing through, often days at a time, cause sometimes you gotta clear your head. Ninja Gaiden 3 took three recording sessions. If you slam your skull into the disc, you too can emerge triumphant. Anyway, my thumb broke. So the game focuses mainly on combat, much like the last game. You walk from kill room to kill room, maybe with a little platforming segment, and more commonly a very painful quick time event in between. Like 2, the game burns you out. Unlike 2, it's done entirely without consideration for the player. Say what you want about 2 being excessive. At least the fights were noticeably finite. When you walked in a room, you often knew what you'd be killing, because enemies quite literally presented themselves all at once. Razor's Edge, in contrast, drip feeds enemies into the conflict, and really extends the amount of time a fight can go on for. The game is extremely quick, gory, and requires the player to pay attention or die, and because we're playing the enhanced port, cutting off limbs and the new steel on bone mechanics spice up play. Steel on bone mechanic is a fancy way to say when the enemy glows an ugly bruise color, do a heavy attack and rip him to shreds for free. And it's kinda necessary because jump into instant essence charge is gone, so players don't have the option to tactically use invincibility periods as often. In some ways, it's harder than the others. And other times, you're just mashing and quick dashing between dudes, sometimes getting executions for mashing. To be honest, I found the combat easiest with the talons, because it gave hefty iframes, let me constantly be attacking but able to cancel out, and sometimes gave me free kills with steel on bone. The problem is, my f***ing <laughs> thumb hurts after every single fight! This game burnt me out harder than two ever could, and that's just a consequence of everything needing to be something. Traveling up a cliff? Climb with kunai. Basic platforming? Shoot the rockets down first or die. Always take down the ranged attackers in every battle or die on fire. Do five back-to-back -back fights with endlessly spawning difficult to fight monsters. Finished? I know you're low on health, so here's an acid floor and another one. There's two more before the next save point! Also, shout out to the original for only having the dragon sword playable with DLC weapons, you idiots. Like in 2, enemies spawn behind you, but sometimes it just doesn't- Why in this room? Why? Other times you're just trying to have a ninja run. Notice how I stop and stare, preconditioned into being afraid. Then GOD! <laughs> WHAT?! I think this game hates me. Real quick, I know your thumb's having a hard time, but could you mash, like, really hard with your thumb to beat these quick time events? Yeah, no problem. Razor's Edge adds unnecessary Ayane sections, which had some good platforming early, and I was so excited that they wouldn't suck. No, they're not necessary. Please expunge yourselves from this game. Is it worth talking about the bosses? Okay. Yo, Ryu, you wanna fight a dinosaur? <laughs> here, here he is! <laughs> Check that oh, out. Oh, what the fuck? They're not all bad, though a couple really get into obnoxious progression hiccup territory with constant quick time events to take down some giant enemy. And honestly, what's the fun of a Ninja Gaiden boss if it's framed cinematically? If I'm destined to win, those desperate 1v1 struggles feel infinitely more substantive because at least it's a challenge where the player has to create their own action shots, you know? I'll grant that some of them are multi part active challenges that require strategy. I like the spider tank because you gotta reveal its weak point by ripping four plates off after comboing them. It's telling the player to quickly and frantically do their damage, and the more plates come off, the harder it gets. But you can save them all for one quick go at the end and win safer. It's kinda cool. Some of the bosses are just 
Abuse steal on bone or die? At least it's a mechanics check, though it should have come earlier. I don't know what to make of the masked man fight. In one way, he's like the Doku Genshin of this game. Nice right pure dork. But I never got my finger on the pulse of the battle. You fight him four times, and despite his attacks being consistent throughout, I needed to use different tactics every time and I don't know why. The guy can kill you extremely fast, it's frantic and harrowing. It only really got tough in the final version where seemingly nothing I did previously worked on him. It makes me feel like I stumbled through with blind luck each time. Maybe there's some merit to the straightforward Doku and Genshin fights after all. Overall, half the bosses were easy and the other half took about as long as the whole level previous to take down, counting the retries. It's wildly unsatisfying to do so well and suck in equal measure, but the most standard out problem to me is story. I can choose to take breaks and avoid Carpal Tunnel, right? But the story is integral to the game, even gameplay. We get a lot of slow and stilted dialogue, a lot of new characters, a lot of scenes, even awkward character development, and it's kind of baffling that they went in this direction. Ninja Gaiden is a game where a ninja kills a Macbeth quoting demon in a clock tower. Ninja Gaiden is a game where you lop off five heads simultaneously with wind blades. Ninja Gaiden cannot make a female character with without doing this. Why ascribe any kind of weight to this absolute train wreck of a narrative base? Why build on this? So naturally, the only answer is to get the guy who wrote Chrono Trigger. The writer here worked on Chrono Trigger, Xenogears, Final Fantasy VII, all kinds of big names, and some World of Mana games. This ain't no rube. Some of the works hit or miss, sure, and writing isn't usually just one dude, and even then you have to work the story into the game. It's a tough gig. But this thing's a mess. I understand a bit was cut between this game and the original, specifically Ryu slaughtering, surrendering mercenaries, and it's clear they wanted to push the idea that Ryu's a monster. I mean, he is a brutal murderer. Maybe you've heard. And that's a great conceit to push in the story. So Ryu gets this cursed arm that's basically going to outright destroy him for all its murder, past and present. Decent scenes like this one with the little girl are dripping with tension cause you're waiting for the guy to go crazy and just tear her head off. But in practice, the arm makes you limp around for a while, then enters some kind of nightmare realm where to quell the murderous spirits trying to punish Ryu for his murder, he has to murder them into oblivion to chill out. Papa Zen, bro, man, just chill. Like, this would have been the perfect place to reinforce that Ryu's a master of discipline and just make you do a quick time event with a button combination to end it or something. It's his most defining character trait and it saves minor thumb damage from the exhaustion of repetitive battles. Why are we doubling down on the trash? Or like others have suggested, why not make killing or murder charge a bar that gives you a power up? Really have Ryu embody the Satsui no Hado, you know? Make him a Kuma. Give him the old It just kind of drops the ball by implying he's a terrible person, even though he'd be dead otherwise, making him kill, having the little girl scream, <laughs> then vaguely hand-waving his crimes in the end. It's dumb. The conflict didn't matter. Other idiot things include the little girl going full Dragon Guard, then her dad going, uh, yeah, I'm gonna try to kill you now, Ryu, even though we had that, that last level together, because I have to uh, at least, like, pretend to be a decent dad and stop you from killing her. So you kill him, stop the girl, and it all works out in the end. He died for... NOTHING! All of this to push this false characterization of Ryu as a loving parental substitute. Ryu doesn't need to be humanized, he's a vehicle for mass murder. And if you're gonna do it, make it understandable, yeah? Make it hard for Ryu to relate with other people. Make it so when he's called a murderer, or when doubt is cast on his character, he feels it, because everybody knows who he is and what he can do. Hype that tension up between other characters. Don't make him the soft-hearted substitute parent who splits dude's skulls open and bathes is in Viscera daily. I think the grossest thing about this game is how unlike Ninja Gaiden it is, but looks the part. How it wears the game's skin. Yeah, different doesn't mean bad, but if you're highlighting all the things Ninja Gaiden sucks at, except overlong platforming, maybe you're on the wrong path. Even if Itagaki remained, it's hard to say what Ninja Gaiden would have become. One thing's certain, hand someone's vision to someone else and things will never be the same. The first two games are leagues ahead of the third installment, and the reality to me is that those games knew what they were and tried not to bog the game down with so much excess. Trimming the fat without trimming the heart. When a particularly long or frustrating section happened, it was a mountain dropped in front of the player. When 3 gets long and frustrating, that's just the game. The good news is, the older entries hold up pretty well today. And the actual good news is, now that I've beaten some really hard games, no one will ever say I suck at games again, right?
Hey, it's K-Bash. Special thanks goes out to my $4 patrons, whose names are on the screen. The show's on its way somewhere good thanks to the community's generosity. And special thanks goes out to my extra generous patrons, who are... Errol. Aquari Wave. Azero. Bazcart. Boha. Brandon. Caesar T. Chief. Color Crimson. Corgi the Lad. Crack Stuntman. Crusader Bear. Kyle Lapreed. Don't worry about it. Dylan Coffey. Exa. Frankenstitch. Harkaj. Huey. Jason Lasky. Jaden. J. Deus. John Weber. Joke Frog. Justin Sherry. Kelvin. Lady Sarah Bellum. Latrix. Laundry Mom. Lego Sid. Mark Yulees. Marmato. Max Gomez. Milky Moo Official. Neatsy. Old Burgle. Orn Magnus Palson. Quillworth. Reggie Rodriguez. Salty Smasher. Sam Anga. Seamus Nerd. Shod. Simp. God! Super Sandwich Guy. Tom Crowick. Thrips Heartrop. Venom. Vic. Walter Taggart. Well, shit. Zachary V. Zane the Impure. Zane the Pure. If you'd like to help support the show and make it even better, check out my Patreon. We've got all kinds of goals and lots of rewards in store. Stay tuned for more. K-Bash out.